So um, I'm going to let the, the panelists introduce themselves, but before we get started, you know, it's Space Week in Seattle at the same time that it's AI Week uh, in Seattle. And so this conversation couldn't be more timely. If you want to know more about the Space Week events that are going on, go to spacenorthwest.org. Org, space northwest.org um, and you can find out all about it um, but when you think about the kind of mega trends of our time two of the big ones are space and AI when you think about how transformational what is happening in these fields will be to future generations it cannot be understated and when, when you think about space and AI together, it's not a new thing. It's been around for a while. It's been a staple of science fiction going back to you know, the, the 60s uh, and even before. Um, but what's different now is the accomplishments and the pace of those accomplishments that are happening all the time in both domains. The, the pace over the last few years has just, you know, shifted into a really high gear. And um, it's also really interesting how there is a focus on democratization and entrepreneurship that is driving all of these things. So um, this is why I'm so excited for this panel. Um, and I will uh, let the uh, panelists introduce themselves. <coughs> okay, sounds great. Hi everyone, my name is James Burke. I'm the executive director of the Mars Society. Has anyone here uh, heard of the Mars Society before? Okay, so most people here. For those who haven't, we are a global nonprofit that advocates for a human mission to Mars. And we also do research towards that end. We operate two research stations, one in Utah, one up in the Arctic in Canada. We actually have a crew going up there in about two weeks. And so we are trying to prepare for what we believe is our human future in space and settling Mars. Locally, we've started a Mars Technology Institute and we're trying to um, find a permanent uh, headquarters for that in the Seattle area we're currently located in Bellevue. Um, my personal journey, I moved to Seattle in 1998. Uh, that was the year I started working at Microsoft and that was the year the Mars Society was started also. And I started volunteering for the Mars Society back then. And it's just amazing, I was telling the other panelists, it's just amazing to see how much activity is going on in Seattle for space. I've been trying to get things going here for over 25 years and I'm just so thrilled and happy that we finally have a thriving space economy here locally, not only with startups, but all the established players as well. So I'm just thrilled to be here and I can't wait to talk more about AI. Yeah. And James is also co-founder um, and on the board of directors of Space for Mars. Hi everyone, my name is Kelsey Dirksen. Um, I have a few hats. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford in the Oxford Theoretical and Applied Machine Learning Group. Um, and I'm also a research affiliate with the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, or JPL. So I work on the Scientific Understanding from Data Science Initiative at JPL. And essentially that's where we have AI experts and machine learning engineers like myself work with domain experts at JPL. I work with atmospheric physicists to be able to kind of bridge that gap between kind of the pure science and AI domains. And I work on um, air quality projects and improving physics models there. Um, and I'm also a UN um, data science consultant as well. So I work on uh, with UNICEF specifically using earth observation and AI technology to map schools. We're mostly focused on kind of what we call the global south, so in developing regions in uh, the African and South American continent. So I'm very much interested in kind of like how we can use AI and Earth observation to help life on Earth. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Keith Rosemont. Um, first of all, I just want to say it's so cool to see everybody here and all the interest and like the amazing panel that I get to be on. So that's really cool. Um, I'm a partner here at the Drone Adventure Labs. Um, which is the, the upstairs and just down the hall that invests in startup companies in the Pacific Northwest. I focus largely on AI companies, um, so that's a little bit of my AI credential. Um, but before I came here, uh, I was head of technology for Paul Allen at Vulcan, 
and I was his liaison to the Strata Launch Project and to the AI Project and a bunch of other um, very interesting technical personal projects that he had. And um, really, he was very um, enthusiastic about driving this connection between the physical, especially space, and computing and artificial intelligence. Um, among other things, I was also the first handful of people um, sitting in Jeff Bezos's living room when we put together Blue Origin. And I was there for a bunch of years through their first set of launches. Uh, and then way, way back before a bunch of startups, um, I was a scientist to JPL, um, where I was a, a radar astronomer and I worked on things like Cassini and Magellan and asteroid sciences. So from way back to the way front, um, love, love this space, love AI, and it, it's just so much different. Uh, that's how I like to follow one, two, three. Um, I try. Uh, so, hi, Bob. Um, Hannah Sublevska. I'm the, the COO and President of Cognitive Space. Um, we are building an AI solution for satellite constellation operations. Um, I got my start in the remote sensing industry some 25 years ago with Conos, which is the world's first commercial high resolution imaging satellite and stayed with uh, Space Imaging, GUI, Digital Globe, MapNow, Maxar for a number of years, also took a spin out into strata launch and launch vehicles and Virgin Orbit for working through Sir Richard Branson. Um, also spent some time working on optical inter-satellite links um, at Linaric and also selling um, fairings and bits of rockets to various uh, uh, rocket companies in the US and around the world. Um, so very excited to be on this panel because we're bringing together so many different threads here in terms of funding, in terms of the research in AI, ML, um, you know, real world operations, which is what, what we're doing, and also thinking about humanity's future being multi planetary. So this would be great. Yeah, I'm really excited. excited. Um, <clears throat> so, um, could each of you talk a little bit about how AI applies in your domains and some of the some of the recent developments and and uh, near future pipeline. That uh, that you see that's that's kind of moving things along, changing the game, making things possible that work. Yeah, I can talk really quick about like how AI applies to the exploration of Mars, but also how AI applies to running a nonprofit. <laughs> um, Mars, you know, we've been using autonomous navigation since the '90s to explore Mars with rovers. So AI is not new for our space. Um, it's not always perfect but we've been using techniques like AI for a long time. More recently, I think, you know, having domain awareness in the AI system is really a key area of growth right now, a key thing that we all need to develop, and so we're starting to work on that with our Mars Technology Institute's AI project. Um, running a nonprofit, like the Mars Society, we use AI a lot of ways, actually. We use it for generating initial content ideas, and outlines of content. We use it for artwork, uh, marketing, uh, collateral that we start with. Um, we usually have to refine it a lot. We just have to play with it a lot because these tools are not perfect. Nothing comes out perfect the first time, but uh, it is very powerful for us. Yeah, I can piggyback maybe off what you said with respect to the domain expert involvement in AI models. So for me, my job at JPL is really to make space scientists' life easier. That's what I aim to do as kind of the machine learning, the machine learning engineer there. Um, and so what we're trying to do and trying to tackle is understanding first, what are, the, what are the actual science needs? What do you want to get out of these massive data sets that you can't currently get or that take an enormous amount of overhead? So for us, we're really interested in um, surface ozone or you can just think about it as uh, air pollution or air quality. Um, and so when we're trying to run physics-based models uh, with hundreds if not thousands of different parameters and various tweaks of how you could initialize your parameters in these physics models, this takes hours, days, weeks to run these types of models to get results out. Whereas with the AI pipeline that we're building in JPL, we can do things in a matter of, of hours, um, which is really nice. We can basically create an emulator or a scaled down version of a physics-based model to be able to output similar, um, if on par if not better, estimates of air quality uh, on scales for us relevant to human health impacts. So, I think that's one of the things that AI is really, really great at doing is synthesizing large data sets into something that's meaningful. And particularly in the space science domain, that's what we're trying to do is figure out, first of all, what, what is interesting to the scientists? Um, and are we doing it in a way that's, again, explainable and kind of um, interpretable enough for, for the space domain scientists? Go ahead. 
So I, I can bring you back up the scale of things. So um, for us, in, in, when you think about space operations and on orbit operations, um, it's, scale is where the problems begin. So if you think about a, a commercial remote sensing um, satellite, if there's one satellite, typically that, that required a few people to make the planning of you know, which order is going to be collected when for which customers to get those shipped out on time. Um, so you can think about that, you know, the game board is the laws of physics, right? And your satellite is governed by those same laws of physics. And the variables are what the customers want, when they want it, how quickly they want it, um, and how often they want it. And that changes, all of those variables change all the time. And every time you perturb the plan that you just made for the next orbit, it has downstream perturbations on every orbit that follows. Now, if you multiply that from one satellite to many satellites, and you think about not one order, but 10,000 orders on every satellite um, with a constellation of 20 or 200 birds, you can start to see how that problem, it, it becomes exponentially harder, and that's where the AI solutions come in. And explainability, to Kelsey's point, um, is super important because nobody wants, to, wants your AI to be making decisions they don't understand about something that's flying. At, you know, 16,000 or 17,000 kilometers an hour um, uh, out, of, uh, out of your control. So explainability is everything. I'll just say with Madrona, I, I think the problem that AI does for us is like, we're trying to figure out where is this all going? Because um, we're trying to find businesses that are the next thing. Um, what's interesting to me is like 18, 20 months ago, Everybody looked at this new AI, generative AI thing, and said, "No, you can't do that." And then, and then, like six months later, everybody's like, "What can it do?" And now we're kind of like, "Okay, we kind of know what it does and what it doesn't do, um, but where is it going?" And and what's interesting to me with respect to the space thing is, 20 years ago or so, we were in the place where space launch was something that only countries could do. It took the resources of an entire nation, sometimes many nations. If you look at Europe only three people put something in orbit at that point took all those resources to get something up and that was the only way to do it and it was just at that point that a couple small companies started putting things in orbit with the resources of a tiny company and a little bit of investment and it was the same but where is all this going and so you know maybe you're right Mike how do we put the, those two things together and figure out where to go next I'm interested on this um, this question of explainability and, and Keith, what you pointed out about, like, we, we kind of know what it does, we kind of know what it doesn't do, right? Um, being able to uh, trust an AI in a variety of situations, right? Whether you're um, managing a constellation and tasking the satellite to go do, you know, take pictures of this or, 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 or that. Um, or, you know, you are dependent on it on a long duration mission on Mars, right? Um, you, you have to be able to understand how the decisions are being made. Can you, can you, um, can you explain a little bit about explainability and uh, why, why that's important, how it's being addressed, and does it impact scale? So um, explainability, for, as we do it at Cognitive Space, means a few things. Um, first of all, when we, when we engage with a new customer, we run in what we call shadow operations modes. So we have their existing systems running, and we run our, our AI-driven system alongside, so we can see how it's making decisions, and we can then show the customer why did it make that decision, what KPIs are driving the reward function on, on that particular um, part of the ensemble, ensemble algorithm, to make it decide to do these things. Um, and that, that creates trust. And Keith made a really good point, actually, when we were talking before the panel, that it's one thing for us to be able to explain the, the technical jargon of the AI solution, but unless we explain it in the, in, the, in the vocabulary of the customer and tie it back to their business KPIs or their operational needs or the, the things that they measure and talk about every day, it's not explainable. So it's super important to, to be able to do that. Yeah, an area of research I work on with GPL is called uncertainty quantification. It's very similar, or you, know, you can almost maybe interchangeably use it with explainability. And basically, we're trying to understand what our model, to know what our model doesn't know, right? We don't want to train our model on pictures of cats and dogs, show it a picture of a turtle. It should tell me with very high confidence that it's a, a dog. That's not good, right? We, we, don't, we don't want that. Same thing for, for space science applications as well, right? So 
Um, this is an area um, at JBL that we're trying to figure out, first of all, what is the best uncertainty quantification method to use? There is a plethora of different methods from like Bayesian statistics to um, other methodologies. Um, there's no kind of one method that rules them all. Um, so essentially what we're trying to do is understand to a certain degree, or at least be able to quantify how confident we can be in the predictions our model is making. And that way you can, especially from like a space operations point of view, um, particularly if you're going to kind of deploy an AI model on a, a spacecraft that you're no longer going to touch, if it's a rover on Mars or something like that, um, kind of more so using the AI as a support system rather than a complete replacement of an operations or, or a science person on the mission. I'm very much of the mind that we should be supporting space missions with AI, not necessarily completely replacing the need for a satellite operator or something like that. I also used to be a satellite operator, so maybe that's why, because I, <laughs> I like that job. Um, so yeah, I think that that's another area of kind of explainability is trying to actually quantify what we know and don't know and kind of the limits to our, to our models. So we can also just be honest from like a you know both a science and just business perspective of what these models actually can do and what decisions you should make based on the outputs from from your AI model. Yeah, explainability and transparency are really important for improving accuracy. Um, I had a really interesting experience a couple of days ago when we were asking my boss Robert Zuber, who's a very prominent uh, Mars scientist and knows a lot about different space disciplines. We said, give us a question that would stump the AI. And he said, well, ask it to design a valve for a zero pressure high altitude balloon and where that valve would be placed on the balloon. So we typed that into ChatGPT 4.0, this is two days ago. And the answer it came back with was factual. It talked a lot about valves and how valves work on a zero pressure balloon. It talked about how you would want to test a high pressure balloon like that, or high altitude balloon like that. But it was totally wrong, and, and Robert was like, no, it's, I wouldn't put the valve there, and that's not the right kind of valve that we use. So um, the gap there is the LLMs don't have the space domain expertise. We gotta augment that with some other system, you know, like a ret retrieval, augmented generation, or something like that, specialized database that would know the space domain and could you know, improve the accuracy of the LLM. We definitely started to see those very specialized um, LLM applications. So uh, there's a company called Dante that, that started doing geospatial search specifically. So they're very narrow focus on, I, I want to understand the geography of something, um, which, and, you know, working in planning, you know, you know, instinctively what I'm, what I'm referring to. Right, so, so placing something, in, you know, X, Y coordinates, flat long coordinates somewhere on the Earth is, you know, the basis of all satellite data collection. Um, and there are, you know, LLMs that don't understand that. Um, and Dante has gone very deep on that, so I can literally say, you know, I, I need to understand the lat latitude and longitude of this particular Scarborough Shoal um, and understand that, you know, a watch box of 20 kilometers around it, and Dante will understand that, which is great. But it wouldn't be able to build a valve for a balloon at altitude. Yeah, I think just to piggyback off that, I think we see ChatGPT and these types of tech that are really, really good on benchmark data sets, like digits or pictures of cat's dogs, or um, there's like fashion MNIST, so like pictures of like uh, sweaters, t-shirts, etc. And then when we try to apply it, apply it to space data, it completely fails. Earth observation data has a ton of different problems and issues with it, modalities, <laughs> you're having different resolutions, different sensors, sensors that are you know, maybe deployed in the 80s that we're still using the data sets from now, but now we have a new, um, new sensor that's similar but slightly different. So I think that's like one of the kind of areas of the next step for these sort of like foundational models or LLMs for geospatial and space-based data um, that I'm like really excited to see because right now a lot of it's been trained on data straight from the internet. Um, but I, you know, space data is a lot more complex than just strings of text. Yeah, and space operations for a long time ran on heuristic algorithms, right? And those are great if, if your variables aren't changing all that much, right? But now we're in a world where, where things change very quickly, mm -hmm. and those heuristics-based algorithms break down pretty fast. They're super brittle. Um, and so, you know, a, a system that's, that's learning as it goes and, and is explainable is really what, what any space company is looking for if you're going to introduce AI into the mix. So it's really interesting because what you're describing sounds like um, you know problems that are coming over the horizon that AI is we're, we're grabbing for that tool to solve them that in a way that we can't 
already. Um, and, and the AI, AI needs to grow as our use cases in space also grow. I'm, I'm curious from a research perspective, um, how does AI help accelerate the, uh, the pace of our acquiring knowledge, the pace of our design, um, and uh, to be able to solve these problems that we're going to be facing in space? I mean, even just from like a development perspective, so I, I come from kind of more of a software computer engineering background, and having things now like Copilot, other coding assistive tech is massive. Right now we don't have to think about like the real, the basics of, I don't have to like go through Stack Overflow every every time I wanna, you know, sort a data frame. I can kind of get Copilot to do that for me and kind of be more of a, again, like a support system. So I think just in terms of on the research side and like coming from academia, um, basically all of my lab mates and all, all of my colleagues um, in the computer science domain are using these kind of assistive technologies just to make things faster so you don't have to worry so much about like the very minute things of designing um, you know your for loops to be as efficient as possible like I think this is actually going to really really speed up like data processing so that we can now then tackle um, more complex problems where we're trying to do things like um, explainability and certain quantification and that type of stuff. You know, there was a Super Bowl commercial for Salesforce recently that said something like, if AI is the Wild West, then doesn't that make data the new gold? And so, you know, I think our approach to get ready for AI at the Mars Society with our scientific research is to really be thoughtful about how we're collecting data, to have standards where they don't exist. Um, that's important. Like, we're, we are working on a project with the other space analogs around the world to standardize across them all, how we collect data, and how that data would be structured, and even maybe have a system in the cloud that they all could write to together. Um, so that, you know, that for us, that's important to make sure that we can really work together as a community and do research together. Cool. Um, Keith, curious about <laughs> kind of tur turning to uh, the investment side of, uh, of the coin, right? Um, what trends are you seeing um, with AI and space, and how do you evaluate companies that are trying to play in this Yeah, space? that's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I'll say that, well, maybe they're kind of two sides of the same coin. First of all, it's always hard to make a new business, or any business, right? And, and space is like super hard, which is really kind of a bummer to say, because I love space, I love space businesses. Um, I think I've backed investments in three. <laughs> so it's really hard. Um, and, and you know, not only is it the usual business risk that you see everywhere, you need a team that can execute and, and you need a good business plan, but you have to overcome all the other things that space brings. Super big technical risk, um, lots of upfront capital. You know, I can't tell you how many business plans I've seen which are like, if you only give me a billion dollars, I can go do this and I'll print money out. Like, okay, <laughs> that's great. Um, you know, so, so those things are all really hard. But I think on the good side, compared to your 25 years ago, there is a space economy now, right? There actually are lots of businesses here. The fact, like, there's businesses all over this room that are actually space businesses. And I think that's super exciting and gives us somewhere to go. Um, a lot of the businesses that I see now that I, you know, are approachable and, and you think can go somewhere um, are actually kind of the boring ones. They're like, um, you know, how do I manage this part of, of your data gathering or something like that? Or, um, you know, I guess I'll just say one of the reasons that space is really expensive is because in order to get to space, we have very narrow tolerances. And you have to pay some people who are super smart and super highly trained. You have to pay a lot of those people, and you have to pay them to do really boring, mundane things. Like they have to check to make sure you've got the right valve or, <laughs> or the right material. Right? Like, like you, you pay really smart people a lot of money to do things that are really pretty boring. And if we can get AI to do that, I'd be pretty excited about that. AI is pretty good at that stuff. Um, so we're seeing that. We're like, how do you manage your engineering processes? Can we make our CAD systems better? Can we make the design of materials better? You know, Airbus has done some amazing things with AI structured materials um, to support aerospace things. Like, really cool things like that. So that's where I'm excited about AI and space businesses, something that can be 
sort of practically approachable. Um, I don't think we're going to see like a HAL business anytime soon. <laughs> so, you got thoughts on that too? Um, definitely the, the um, AI designed aerospace parts. Um, I saw some things in Swiss company as well, not, not Airbus, but um, that, that, that's, you know, that's a game changer um, in many ways because you now you're able to build things that are stronger and lighter and they just they look kind of weird because because of, it's taking the actual um, properties of the material into account in, in design in a way that, that we haven't in our engineering processes to date. Um, and so it's opening up a whole new possibility in terms of what you can build and how you can build it. You can 3D print things that you couldn't even four or five years ago. Um, and you know, with the advent of Starship and you know, the, the sheer, that's a step change for the industry in terms of our ability to get things to orbit. I don't think the public in, in general understands just how big a change that vehicle is gonna bring. We've, throughout the history of the, the space program, we've optimized for, for weight and volume. And that has gone away. So if we combine that with AI-driven um, engineering design and it's materials-driven, we're in a whole new world of, of possibility. Um, and we're just, just getting started. We're kind of already seeing it now. Um, one example of a billion dollar idea that actually got uh, realized recently is Starlink. You know, Starlink, they were able to build this whole internet constellation because they also, the same company had the rocket technology to launch the satellites. And, you know, back, for those of you that have lived in Seattle for a long time, there was another company that was trying to do that back in the 90s, Teledesic, with Bill Gates and Craig McCall. And it was basically the same idea to build a, an internet, a low orbit, low Earth orbit internet satellite network. But it was just before its time. And it was too hard then. And now, now we have that. And, Fortunately, they're building the satellites in Redmond, which makes Redmond the world space capital for satellite manufacturing. Very cool. Um, I'm curious, um, when, when you need to um, bring AI to a space domain problem, what's the interdisciplinary collaboration look like? Um, you know, there's, there's lots of specialization um, in both domains, and how do you make sure you've got the right people around the table? That's, that's a really great question. Um, most space projects are by definition multidisciplinary and touch ma many different aspects of science and engineering. Um, and so I can envision an AI system, and we actually are working on this, where you would have multiple agents with, ha with each having their own subject matter expertise and you could sort of use them as consultants and, and get research done quicker that way. Um, but it, you know, something where you have the ability to, to tap into multiple deep databases that don't yet exist. You know, I'll say it depends. I think it depends on whether you're talking about a product here on Earth or whether you're actually talking about an in-space product. Um, one of the things we're really interested in looking at, and I think it, I'm, I'm a firm believer this is coming, is AI at the edge. And that's a whole other set of interdisciplinary problems that we're just getting to. Um, but there are so many things we can't do, especially in space, unless we have AI at the edge. And you know, we did see this move with ML at first. ML was originally a very cloud, local, you know, sort of desktop-centric thing, and it did find its way out to the edge. Uh, it took a lot of work, but got there. And, and I, I think AI is going to go that way too. And when we're looking for expertise in how to get into space. I would say figuring out how to get to the end point is really important. You want to talk about power issues and AI? Power and heat. <laughs> power and heat <laughs> in space, it's a whole different whole game. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, clearly there are big challenges there. Clear, clearly big challenges. Um, how do you do all that? You know, even if it's the edge on Earth, it's a problem right now. But um, I'm sure we'll get there. I'm sure we'll I mean, there are some constellations today that use AI to remove clouds from, from Im images or, or score images for clouds and, and only download the good, the quote unquote, good pixels to the ground. So there's, there's some of that edge processing is being done and some of that is, is you know, machine vision in, you know, on orbit today. Um, but those are fairly, the, the things that are being done are fairly light compute in the grand scheme of things. And when we start talking about heavy compute at the edge, that's, that's a whole different ballgame. 
Um, yeah, even from my time at Planet I, so I left Planet in 2022, but before that we recent, like we had just uh, recently published a paper on using AI for satellite um, orbit anomaly detection, and we integrated it with Slack, and we were able to basically get Slack pings when we saw anomalies on orbit, which was really nice, because okay. our team was five people in San Francisco, five in Berlin, and 200 plus satellites, so um, it was a lot for only five people at a time for, for monitoring. Um, so that, that was critical, and, and that also took into account not only the software devs, like myself on the team, but the kind of aerospace engineers, electrical engineers, like working interdisciplinary with all of those teams to understand, first of all, what are the realistic anomalies we could capture, and what are the data sets we have that we could train an AI model to be able to recognize, um, and can we do, like, basically AI-generated anomaly um, detection, but then also mitigation, or do we need kind of just the detection part from the AI model and then the mitigation from the operator? Mm -hmm. Again, that's kind of like a risk reward um, sort of balance there. Yeah. And that's definitely something that comes up in, you know, in the solutions that we have. So, so we're looking at the parameters of each spacecraft and the health and status of the spacecraft. And um, we, we have the ability to tune the algorithm, um, or the, the operator has the ability to have us tune the al algorithm so that we can take into account um, you know, if you have a second generation of spacecraft, let's say they all had a, a reaction wheels that are not as performant as the first generation. So you know that the second generation spacecraft, you need to be a little care more careful about how you fly them um, than the first gen. So we can tune uh, our algorithms to say, okay, if, the, if, if the, the order is sent to a second generation spacecraft, you're not, you're not going to turn as fast, you're not going to go as far off nadir to collect that imagery um, and do those things. And there's a, definitely a predictive loop there as well. So as the health and status, status is coming down from the spacecraft, we can get ahead of that and say, you know what, reaction wheels in generation three are not also not behaving well. And so we can start to change how we fly the, the fleet to take into account all those things. Something that, that, you know, 10 years ago, not possible. Yeah, constellations are a great use case, right? Because we effectively have 200 of the exact same or identical spacecraft. So if you've had the same satellite launched in you know, 2015, then a similar generation in 2022, you can use that historical data to train a model to still be used in 2022. That's what's, what's really, really nice about um, Constellations, why it makes it a perfect use case for, for these types of models. Okay, you talk about how far we've come in the past 10 years. Let's talk a little bit about how far are we going to go in the next 10 years? <laughs> right. 10 years from now, humans will have returned. 10 years from now, humans will have to return to the moon. Right? You're waking up in that world. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you're on the moon. Maybe you're someplace else, your favorite planetary destination. James, I'm sure that's Mars for you. Um, what does AI look like in, in your world? What are the things that you're hoping will come true and the impact that it will have on, on our day-to-day -day and our future in space? I was just thinking when you were talking, it would be cool if your constellation work was being applied to a flotilla of starships heading to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that AI is going to help with when we're exploring the surface of the moon or Mars. There's a whole set of hardware and software that has yet to be developed to do that. Um, we've been looking a lot, our, one of our advisors did a real deep dive on how the Apollo astronauts interacted with each other and with Capcom back on Earth. And he came to the insight that the uh, Apollo 17 astronauts were using Capcom almost like an AI bot. Because the Capcom knew everything and knew all the backroom information uh, back in Earth, on Earth with all the scientists. Uh, they even asked Capcom, where are the pl empty plastic bags on our rover? Oh, they're under the passenger seat. The two <laughs> astronauts didn't know that, but Capcom did. And so you can imagine having an AI edge device, um, which could be like a, a rover following the crew around, walking around the moon or Mars. And it's something that they're, it's watching them, it's taking stock of how everyone's doing, it's monitoring their health, it's monitoring any scientific uh, instruments they have. A lot of the times on the, with Apollo, they were radioing back gauges constantly. And there's like one five decimal six, you know, and, and, and they're spending tons of time doing that. Why, you know, now we would just have wireless telemetry for that. Um, so there's a lot of, and you can imagine an AI bot wirelessly observing and re relaying that stuff back without the astronauts having to do anything. So there's a lot of, applications not just for designing missions with AI, but for using AI as part of operations on the surface of the Mars. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the, the ethos with the scientific understanding from data science initiative at JPL is to increase the speed, depth, and rigor of scientific return, and I think that's exactly what AI is going to enable us to do, especially for when you think about deep space missions. The biggest bottlenecks are things like bandwidth, storage on board spacecraft, power limitations. Um, so if we have models on board that can tell us and only send back the most important or what we qualify as the most important or interesting data or pieces of information, that's going to rapidly increase the amount of scientific discovery we can get from these types of missions rather than having to send everything back and now we have you know 500 pictures of uh, a speck of dust that actually wasn't important. We can kind of down select <laughs> and, and look at like the most interesting rocks to zap with our Mars rover. Um, so I think that's definitely going to be that's something we're going to see is just the massive acceleration of scientific discovery with, with these types of technologies. Well, I like James's big vision for like the, the, the you know the, the armada of spaceships controlled by AI going somewhere. I think that's probably you might have been on the big vision thing. That I was giving Mike a hard time at the be get pre-talk because I was saying, well, what should we not say? So I will <laughs> I will hold back from saying I think in ten years we'll have an AI overlord and we'll just. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, in, in all seriousness, I actually think, and, and this might be more boring. Right now, AI is very much in our face. You know, and, and if I look at other historical technical trends, the internet, mobile phones, originally those things were all very much in our face. And I kind of hope that AI does the same thing. It just melds into the background and becomes another power tool for us that we use constantly as for what we do without it needing to be in our face and us thinking about what we're prompting all the time. And, and hopefully it will be maybe like Capcom where Rather than us like having to Google stuff all the time and try to put pieces together, it really will accelerate our ability to learn, which is what I think it's doing. Um, and it'll be a tool where we need to know something and it helps us learn that right away. And, and maybe that'll be originally, personally, just knowledge that we humans have already gathered by the world, but maybe, maybe as we do newer exploration, it'll help us do those explorations ahead of us, you know, that really intelligent Mars rover would be pretty super cool. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll be on Neptune or something, and um, I'd go for that. I think we can help with that. So, <laughs> cognitive space has a very clear 10-year goal. We want to, we want to um, orchestrate a million intelligent machines across a multi-planetary system. So everything that we're learning about how to apply constellations effectively applies to uh, constellations of, th of things that are on the water, on, on the Earth, on the moon's surface, in orbit around the moon, in orbit around Mars, on Mars surface and beyond. Um, and so 10 years from now, absolutely, we'll have multiple constellations across multiple planetary systems. I like that vision. Um, thank you so much. I think uh, we're looking pretty good on time. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Hi, uh, to go along with the themes of uh, interdisciplinary teams and really smart people, I'm wondering to uh, keep your companies innovating there, what have been the um, hardest types of talent to find on your teams? Do you foresee a skills gap being a challenge at all for your growth plans? As a VC backed startup, competing with Google for data scientist talent is really hard. <laughs> data scientists are definitely in high demand. It's been really easy for me to recruit tech talent because there's a lot of tech people that are interested in space, I think. You guys also being an example of that, all the interest we've had for this panel. Um, you know, we have we started an AI project uh, early this year with the Mars Technology Institute, and I just walked into the co-working space down in Bellevue that all the ex Microsoft people hang out at, and I met my my team lead right then. Um, so I've actually had pretty good luck just finding folks that are interested in switching over to a different field, because we could utilize a lot of their expertise they already have with the space projects coming up. All right, so. Uh when you think about the uh, you know the major developments in the past, nuclear weapon and including AI, its impact on the universe and our planet has been devastating for the global south. And I love that you're working on something related to this. I don't know what you're working on exactly, but I'm curious what is it that you can do 
what we can do collectively to prevent this, you know, dystopian future where, you know, some of us would have extreme power from uh, cyberspace, and it's just um, like the differential in power is just increasing to astronomical, um, you know, like degrees. Pun intended. <laughs> You know, that's such a great question. Um, and we talk about it a lot in different ways. Um, it's also like a super broad question. Um, it's probably oversimplified, but it does come down to people and, and what we do with it. You know, I do believe technology is technology. It can be used both ways in lots of kind of ways. Um, I'll just give you some examples. Um, when ML first came out, uh, data labeling was a huge effort and a very expensive part of building machine learning models. Um, I was part of a group that uh, funded a bunch of data labelers in countries in Africa. And it was really interesting because it was people who did not have backgrounds in, educa in educated backgrounds, but got experience in computers, got experience doing actual data activities. And many of them started their own companies in those countries and did more. So maybe just one small way that you can create benefits, but I think trying to democratize access to these tools, whether it's AI or space, and of course being mindful about what the ups and downsides of what you do are really important. Um, you know, but the devil's in the details of all those things for sure, absolutely. Um, you know, ozone science and, and, and taking vision of the Earth and other planets are both pretty helpful things. <laughs> Lots of daylight, and I don't know, is Mars helpful? <laughs> well, there's a lot of, Going to Mars might be good. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, work we do that we hope can also apply to the moon, but also just the analog research we do that, uh, you know, helps a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities for college students to experience, mm -hmm. you know, walking on Mars, on one of our stations, but, yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I think uh, one of the things I can do is, myself as a software engineer, is this tech is thinking about how I can do it equitably and making sure that if I'm using different data sources that I'm not having some inherent bias baked into my model. I think this is something we're seeing a lot. I get a bit worried when I see models being trained off of data straight from the internet like Reddit forums. I don't know if that is a direct representation of what society should be like. So thinking very critically about the data you're using is really, really, really important. On the labeling side too, making sure we're not taking advantage of kind of disadvantaged communities to do data labeling. I'm not saying you did this, but I just want to like also kind of make this a point as well. Um, we have seen, or at least there's been some articles that have come out um, for kind of the, the big LLM models that um, they basically gave very, very little money to the data, labor, data labelers to label pretty horrific passages of text for hours and hours of on end that cause pretty traumatic results you know, to, to those individuals. So um, just thinking about how can we build these models equitably so that they are accurately representing the values that we think society should have. And obviously no one here probably shares the exact same values, so it's really up to like, communicating and having kind of a diverse representation of the people in the room that are building these, these models is really important. And certainly from, a, from an Earth observations standpoint, transparency is everything. Being able to show what is actually happening in the ground, on, on the ground, as opposed to what the media or whatever you know information machine is saying is happening, um, that is ground truth. Um, and so, being able to, to have a, an impact in that in that field and be able to enable more companies to launch different sensor morphologies that allow us to look at different things that are happening. So, so be it thermal, be it hyperspectral, be it LIDAR is another system that's sort of shortly going on orbit. All these different sensor morphologies allow us to collect far more information about the truth of what is happening. And as long as that information become, becomes publicly available and continues to be publicly available, then, then we have a chance of, of knowing ground truth. And that's very, very important. Hey everyone, I, to some of you who have met before, hello to those who have never met before. Um, there's a couple of things that you know make perfect sense, like ML applications with 
you know, big data sets, uh, data science, uh, especially if you're operating at a scale where you have a lot of stuff to deal with. But where things don't quite seem to track as they might with every other consumer or enterprise AI application is, uh, you know, proprietary data sets which are niche um, uh, and things like export control. So, uh, you know, the space industry, at least publicly, is a sparse data set. Uh, and then, you know, I can't hire people in Africa to data label, uh, you know, the design of my export controlled compute system or whatever it might be. So where, where do people see uh, the barriers and opportunities uh, as we try to take this wonderful technology and plug it into the, this, the round hole or the square peg, whichever one of those things that it is, <laughs> uh, that's, that's the defense industry. I mean, that is kind of one problem we're looking at is, is how, do you, how do you take some of the knowledge that's in the heads of prominent space subject matter experts um, without having access to all the work, you know, because their work's not on the internet, it's not part of the LLMs. That have been trained that with the data that LLMs have been trained on, and, and so we are looking at like retrieval augmented generation as one sort of add-on technology to, to make the LLMs more accurate, but also getting certified like getting content that then you can sort of certify um, that you can make sure you understand the pedigree from it and it's accurate, and that's what's going into your system. Um, that's I think going to be an important focus moving forward too. Uh, hey Chris, good to see you again. Um, so, you know, with export control, for those of you who are not familiar, um, there, there is a set of regulations from the federal government called ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations, and you do not want to be ITAR controlled. Trust me on this. <laughs> because if you are ITAR controlled, and any of your tech is ITAR controlled, getting it out of the country for, for legitimate use by a customer who's outside of the US involves enormous hurdles, paperwork, and bureaucracy, and time, um, and lawyers, lots and lots of very There's over-classification and there's over itarification Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you are developing tech for, for the space industry, try, to, try not to use anything that, any code, in particular any code, that is ITAR restricted. So there are code libraries, for example, from, from NASA JPL, that are ITAR restricted, because they deal with things. Um, and so, so try not to use that because if you use any of those snippets of code in whatever your AI solution you're building, your AI solution becomes ITAR controlled and your job of getting international customers in particular is going to be that much harder. You know, Chris, you, you mentioned the defense industry and, and I think it's important, like we're all civilians, I think, in this room and we're all trying to do civilian programs, but there are very advanced defense programs in space and AI, and there's a lot going on there. Like, and there's a lot to be learned from those data sets, and there's a lot to be learned from those code sets. If only. If, 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 <laughs> if, you, if you do, right? Um, and, and I don't know how to bridge that gap. There are people who move back and forth between those industries and carry knowledge about how that works. Um, and that's sort of a residual knowledge argument, but it does, I think, benefit us all to follow what's going on there. Yeah. Um, and keep on top of it, because there have seen some amazing work being done. Very, very smart people. Um, and, you know, there are different politics around defense of all kinds. Um, I talked to the um, CTO of NATO recently, and, like, they're really worried about a lot of things and how to keep, keep the world safe right now. Um, so, you know, you asked about barriers and opportunities, I think it's both. You know, um, and maybe that's your point, but I, I think I think it's important for us all to hear that. Um, I see a, a lot of really great applications of AI, and, you know, in space based applications. Um, especially, you know, like you guys have been talking about with the related to imaging. But let's kind of shift context for a little bit on crew missions, right, and crew safety. So if you remember the Columbia disaster, one of the things was they knew that the foam had hit uh, the leading edge of the wing and caused uh, some problems there, right? Um, so the problem is when you're coming in from space and re-entering, 
right? How do you know predictively if, uh, you know, if there's a, a safety margin that you can withstand or there could be a potential loss to craft? Now, if you look at Starship, just the, the third one, right? They have tile issues as well that cause a loss of craft, right? So when you're doing AI um, for, you know, your, your inferencing is good as your training. And for a lot of things, uh, because of the nature of the physics problems, you cannot really build a good inferencing model with AI. So the, the challenge is, if we want to think of space as a potential future distributed data center where we're doing computations, a lot of the characteristics of AI computations are polar opposites of what we need in physical simulation. So do you guys think that the amount of emphasis you're putting on AI is going to actually do a disservice for the crew safety by neglecting things that are not AI, like physical simulation? You know, it's a great question. When um, Mike asked what I hope happens in 10 years with AI in space, I only thought later, and you reminded me of this, The one thing I think would be really great would be R2-D2s. <laughs> you know, a very smart robot that can go out there and check your wing for you. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't think people are going to neglect physical calculations. I think some of that is actually making our physical calculations easier and faster and better. And of course, we're seeing tons of compute come online, wh which helps compute, a lot. The characteristics to compute for the AI, right, is going to be very bad for the characteristic compute for the, the simulations. You get sparse problems here, dense problems there. And if you try to do sparse on a dense, you'll burn your energy. No, that, that's, that's completely fair. But the you know we end up with a lot more computer chips on all sides, right? This is kind of my point. We'll always end up with more computer chips. No, but up in right. space, though, power is an issue, thermals are an issue. Oh, I see, you're and saying on board. You're burning energy, but not getting computation out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think these are all things that need to be thought through, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe there's some bus technology that could come online to help solve some of these problems. One more question. Yes, I think running a little bit into the previous question, uh, how do you guys foresee in 10 years overcoming with regards to using AI for like operations, uh, tackling the issue of regulatory bodies where determinism is key? So like in aerospace, we've had autonomy for like 50, 60 years, autopilot, but it's all deterministic. And uh, you know, AI being inherently fuzzy or like you're needing a lot of nines after that 99 in terms of like how do you how, is it is it an exercise in futility to try and have AI <laughs> for operations um, or is there was there something else as like an industry we need to be like tackling um, to address that? I see a lot more at least in the in the near future within that sort of 10 year look ahead that AI for operations is more of a support mechanism as opposed to a complete replacement. So even going from, like going back to my time at Planet, even if we had something to go from like highest, most, like most important priority um, anomaly to, to look at to, to least of the you know, 50 anomalies maybe we get in a day, that would enormously help. And you know, we would be able to uh, extend missions longer for, for certain, certain spacecraft. So I don't see it as a direct maybe replacement. And I think, yeah, trying to convince regulatory bodies that REI can Especially even coming from when you have like flybys and things like this, or like near um, near misses. Even when I was up doing ops, we would get emails um, from the FAA for like near flybys that were like hundreds of kilometers apart. Right? That that seems very far for us, but in space that's actually quite close. So I see it more as a support rather than a complete replacement, and being able to at least try to like scale down the number of anomalies we have to directly look at or prioritizing or things like this to help a little bit more. Yeah, and how that's changed. So, so I, I remember earlier, earlier in my career, when we had a notification from NORAD about a, a yeah. you know, a, a potential near, you know, near miss. Um, it was three days of like everybody, everybody in the company was just walking around going, oh my god, oh my god, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? And now there, there are companies like Kahan Space out there, right? That, that's using AI to predict um, the pro the probability of of a conjunction, and there's a certain limit on that probability that you know sets off, you know alerts of various, you know, time, timing windows, etc. So I, that's how I, you know, how I, I see more of that. Um, a lot of the conversations that we have, both with, with government customers and commercial customers, even when companies are talking about lights, lights out operations, right? 
Um, what that really means is, is you still you still have a human on the loop, right? So we're taking the human out of the loop, but not completely. They're on the loop. They're in a supervisory role. They're keeping an eye on on the, on the system. The system is not just left to its own devices. Um, and I think that's that's kind of the, the comfortable spot for regulators today. Like you still need to have the human on the loop um, for a while yet. You know, I'll just say the medical industry went through this over the past 10 years with ML. Uh, it used to be that you could not use machine learning models in any diagnostic because it's a black box. They didn't trust it what's coming out. Um, you couldn't get anything approved that way. But people have went to this support model that you described, which is first let it tell us, let us show us, let us build confidence that this thing is producing reliable results. And over time, We've come to trust that we do now have models that are actually better predictive than humans are at doing some kinds of diagnostics. And the FDA has approved those for use, you know, sort of globally. And, and we got there. It took a long time. It took development on both sides, both through this sort of walk, crawl, run, crawl, walk, run thing, um, but also a lot of understanding on the part of regulators, like how do they wrap their head around this thing and think about it. And, I wouldn't be surprised if we do the same thing, but it'll take time for sure. Yeah. Okay. I think we're uh, just at time, and uh, we'll have a little bit of time to mix and mingle after. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. I wanted to point out Space Northwest has a lot of programs that we do over the course of the year. It's not just Space Week. I kind of felt like it this week. Um, and uh, Space Data Hackers is our monthly online meetup, and uh, we'll have a space and AI talk from AWS in August. Um, so I hope that we'll see you there. Hope to see you at other uh, programs. Hope you enjoy all of AI Week. Thank you for coming. Round of applause for our panelists. Please.